So my name's Natalia, but people call me Tali. And I'm a 20-year-old language student from Leicester, currently doing my year abroad in the south of France. I haven't made too many friends here. I'm not too much of a party girl like my big sister, but the friends that I have, I hold dear to me. I'll try not to bore you too much with the details of my life here, but so far after the first few months, nothing too eventful has happened, besides a couple of run-ins with some local troublemakers. But other than that, I've had a really nice time. The food here is lovely, the city is beautiful, and the weather is a lot nicer than back at home. But a couple of weeks ago, we took a trip around to the south, to my friend Clement's hometown. There are lots of beautiful little villages scattered around this part of the countryside, which are very peaceful, calm, and the people are really pleasant. This is not an area that tourists typically visit. You find that the locals are often bemused to find a foreign person in this part of the country. Not too far from here, there is a slightly larger village... And with the danger of sounding like a broken record, this is another very stunning part of the country that probably not many people know about, besides the locals. In the town, there's a Michelin star restaurant, and we decided to pay a visit here for my boyfriend Brad's birthday, his 23rd to be exact. And as it was now two years since we had met, it was nearly our second anniversary too. He had taken time off work to come to France to visit me, and we were glad to be spending some time together again finally. We booked a table for four in the restaurant, me, Brad, Clement, and his girlfriend, Jeanette. Initially, we had wanted to book into the restaurant's hotel as well. However, it was too dear for students like us, so we booked into an Airbnb instead on the outskirts of town. We enjoyed a lovely meal, and then sat outside drinking wine and smoking cigarettes in true French fashion. We then went for a late night stroll through the town, enjoying the quaint little frog statue situated within the town. After we got too tired, we decided to head back to our Airbnb and rest for the night before we would head off to our next destination. Clement's girlfriend was Catholic and always wanted to visit Lourdes every year as a part of her faith. We eventually made it back to the room and had another glass of wine and a couple more cigarettes before we headed off to bed around 1 in the morning. Now, I woke up at around 3am to the sound of something scratching by the door or window. I couldn't really tell as I had never been here before. I wondered if it could have been a dog or perhaps another small animal like a cat maybe. However, the sounds faded away almost as quickly as they appeared and I quickly drifted off back to sleep. Not long after, however, I was awoken again. Not because of any sound from outside this time, but because Brad had gotten up for the bathroom. I lay back down on the pillow and closed my eyes, but then a, a sudden sense of dread filled me up. I don't know how, but I had a feeling that somebody was just watching me. I looked around the room, with only the moonlight bringing in just enough light to see. I looked over to the window, which should have been closed via the shutter, but again with Brad not being used to the life around here, had forgotten to lock it. And I could see it slowly being pulled open by... A hand outside, its silhouette lit by the moonlight, attempting to open the window while holding something that I couldn't quite make out. I then heard what sounded like an old-fashioned camera shutter closing repeatedly. I hadn't heard one of these in many years, not since my grandfather would take family photos of us, but as I've heard this so many times before, it was unmistakable to me that that was the sound. What felt like an eternity passed by before I could bring myself to open my mouth and yell out to Brad. The person at the window, though, quickly began to climb down, and whilst briefly in the moonlight, I caught a clear glimpse of a very distinctive ring on the left hand. I didn't get a long look at it, but it did appear to be wooden with a distinct marking on one side. Seconds later, the assailant, whoever they were, was gone. Brad rushed outside to try and see who it was, but... All he saw was an empty street, but he could hear the sound of footsteps becoming more and more distant. Obviously, we didn't sleep a wink the rest of the night. Neither of us dared to. We checked out of the room as early as we could once there was sunlight as well. Clement and Jeanette, they went to get the car while me and Brad returned the keys to the lockbox. I messaged the host about what happened, and whilst he seemed sympathetic... He said that he wouldn't be taking any action against what happened. 
A few days have passed since then, and we still have no idea who tried to break in. Brad seems to think that it was the host, as they weren't too apologetic. However, Clement seems to think that it's because they're rich snobs and don't care about foreigners. So I guess that we'll never likely really figure out who it was. I guess the creepiest thing for me, though, is that some perv, some creep out there who tried to break into our place at night has a photo of me lying nude in bed. And I have absolutely no idea who has it and whether or not it might end up online somewhere. I grew up in the middle of nowhere, literally cornfields and cows with the occasional sprinkling of houses filled with people who tended to the cornfields and cows is where I grew up. So as any teenager in the country would do, I spent a lot of time exploring abandoned buildings, houses, barns, restaurants, anything that I could manage to get into. I had just gotten a new job in a town as well that I didn't usually go to and of course immediately asked the locals about the scary stories in the town. I was told over and over again a story from the 80s of a woman who caught her husband cheating and came home one day and blew his brains out while he was asleep apparently. She then went on to end her own life behind the house. According to the local legend, the police never even cleaned the crime scene up. They removed their bodies, but there were many pieces of the husband left behind on the floors and the walls. Immediately, I was pretty interested in this. I asked where the house was and was surprised to learn that it was only 10 minutes away from where I was working. Now, don't get me wrong, I felt brave but as a young female I wasn't about to explore this haunted murder house by myself. I texted some friends of mine the road that it was on and asked them to meet me there that night. They of course had nothing else to do so they agreed. I got off work at around 10pm and met my friends in the front of the house. It was a small white farmhouse, heavily overgrown with weeds and barely visible from the road. I had no idea how we were going to get into it, but I knew that I had to see what was inside. Me and my three friends, two guys and one girl, looked all around and saw my one guy friend found a window that wasn't locked. He was far too large to crawl through, so my smaller guy friend crawled through and unlocked the back door. We climbed through the weeds and we made our way into the house... By the light of our flashlights, we began to explore, and the house seemed pretty much untouched. There were dishes in the sink and old boxes of food in the cabinets. The walls were a mixture of yellow from long-term smoking and patches of brown, which could have been mold or could have been pieces of, well, the husband. Who knows? But I wasn't about to touch it. My guy friends took off into the bedroom, and my girlfriend and I looked for the basement. After some searching, we found the steps to the basement... It was a dark and cave-like unfinished basement with lights dangling from the ceiling that most likely hadn't been turned on in like decades. But the basement had two sections. The first one that you were immediately in was a laundry or sort of washroom. Then behind that was an open storage room. And this is where things started to really turn. You see, we walked into the storage room and we were met by a giant red painted pentagram on the floor. There were shelves all over the walls filled with what appeared to be jars of dead animal parts and blood. There were half-burned candles, upside-down crosses, and notebooks that were falling apart from years of moisture and mold in the air. Suffice it to say, we were pretty creeped out by this. It wasn't until a bit later, too, that I understood what I had saw, but at the time I didn't know much about the rituals that they were most likely performing in this basement... I have no way of knowing if the husband and the wife had done this or if it had been done by other fellow trespassers, but it didn't seem to be very recent. In any case, we decided that we'd had enough of the creepy basement at this point and we head upstairs, only to be greeted by the loud sound of shattering glass. But one of my guy friends had decided to grab a bat from his car and bust out the old TV. We both screamed at him to stop. I mean, yes, I definitely trespassed, but I was never a vandalizer. After taking a few more swings, he stops though, and instead of turning around to yell at me, he starts staring at the kitchen window behind me, and his face looked absolutely terrified. 
Thinking that he was messing with me, I, I tell him to stop being weird and we needed to leave before the cops came and saw this mess. At this time, my friend shifts his gaze from the window and looks at me. He points back to the window and says, what is that? I sort of laugh, again thinking that he's messing with me, but he doesn't laugh. Finally, I turn around and I also see movement in the field behind us, slowly getting closer and closer to the house. We all stand at the window waiting for whatever it is to come out of the field and into the open part of the backyard. A few seconds go by before we see a woman in a long grey nightgown holding a brick in her hand running towards the back window. At this point, she was mere feet away and we all ducked down below the window thinking that she was going to throw the brick through it and we needed to try and avoid the shards of glass. And she did. The window shattered so loud my ears started to ring but... I didn't feel any glass. After a few seconds, we all stood up and looked through the hole where the window once was. The woman, she was gone. And the glass that was shattered from the window was outside on the lawn. I still don't know how this is possible, but she threw the brick at the window. The brick was laying inside on the floor. But the window, the glass, it was broken and outside instead of inside. We all shared a collective, man, to heck with this, and ran out of the house and back to our cars. We spoke about it a few times after, but never to anyone else since we were convinced that they wouldn't believe us. The house has since been torn down, and the lot is now an extension of the field from behind it. And to this day, I don't know exactly what we saw that night, but... I know that I'm certainly glad that the house is no longer there. So I grew up in the woods and have many stories about strange goings on. But this one happened a few weeks ago and I just thought that I should share it here because this seems like a good place to put it. So I had just left my mother's house and was driving back to mine down a back road that I've driven down many times before. I knew this road like the back of my hand and could drive down it with my eyes closed in reverse. No, I haven't actually done that, but you get the point. And as I was getting to the halfway point down this road, there was a thick fog, which is nothing new as there's fog on this road all the time. However, I was driving slowly and started taking turns I really don't remember. There was a, a 90 degree right when it should have been a left, followed by a wide left turn that felt like a, a full circle. Then I drove straight for about 5 minutes with no hills or drops, and that road never has a flat section that long. But there was then a left hand turn up a hill, and as I was going up, all the hair suddenly stood up on my body, and I almost turned around, but I decided to keep going because... I really don't know why, to be honest. But this is when I pulled my gun from my glove box and I had it on my lap. When I looked back to the road, some dude was just crouched in the middle of it. I slammed on my brakes and he didn't even flinch. I figured that it was just some dude going frog hunting or something, as many people on that road do just that. I honked my horn and the guy stood up, but he was massive like at least seven and a half feet tall, thin as anything, and his arms were just way too long. It also looked like he didn't have any clothes on either. I laid on the horn again and clicked off the safety on my pistol just in case. He turned his head in what seemed like almost a, a full 180 degree turn, and his eyes, they had a like predator glow, like a wolf or a cat, and I raised my gun and leaned out the window telling him to get lost. He took a few steps toward me and I know that this was stupid but I tried to pull the trigger and my gun just didn't fire. The hammer clicked but there was no boom. At that I whipped the car around faster than I ever have done before. I then just flew down the road at at least 20 miles per hour over the speed limit. About 30 seconds after I turned around and I realized that all of a sudden, I recognized all the turns in the hills again. I was driving down the road like I'd never taken that first right. 
I went back during the day and still don't know where I took a wrong turn. There are no side streets down that road that are paved and certainly no straightaway as long as the one that I drove. I also went to the range a day or two later and put that same round in the chamber and it fired, no problem. To this day, I really don't have any idea as to what happened. I also don't drive that way at night anymore. Please, tell me someone knows what I saw. None of my friends believe me and even my mother doesn't. But I know that I'm not crazy. I know that this happened. I'll give any extra details that you guys need, but please, if you know anything about what might have happened to me, then do let me know. I was at a warehouse party that is used as an underground venue. I had a couple of drinks and was chatting with a few people when I saw a friend of mine. John and I had been friends since middle school, in my 30s now, and our friendship only deepened after we graduated from high school. But we have had many one-on-one -on -one hangouts, dinner drinks at a bar, etc. And nothing has ever been weird or awkward between us. But we would discuss the typical topics of family, hobbies, politics, stuff like that. John has always been a bit of a, a loner type, I guess, but maintained a few close friendships and I always chalked it up to him being a bit shy. Overall, I just perceived him as a good person and one of the few male friends that I could trust. Anyway, we engaged in conversation and everything was going completely as usual. Then he randomly mentioned that he was jealous of me. This took me aback as at the time nothing was particularly great about my life. No wage job, no serious significant other, a terrible car, etc. But I began questioning him about why he would be jealous of me and several times he tried to change the subject. I kept pressing him. He sounded depressed and I thought that he needed to open up or something. He goes on to say that he's jealous of the way that I interact with people, how naturally it comes to me, how I always have a positive energy about me and how I genuinely care about things. I tell him, well, there must be something you care about. But he proceeds to tell me that he doesn't care about anything or anyone and never has. That all of his friendships are based around similar hobbies, but he genuinely doesn't love or care about a single person that he's ever known. I was very disturbed at this point as I could tell that he was being completely sincere. I asked, well, what about Carlos? Carlos is a mutual friend and the person that I thought to be John's closest friend. He replied, even Carlos. I kept asking him different questions like, not even your mum or your sister? And he was like, no, I don't care about them. I don't hate them, but I don't love them. I never have. This conversation carries on for a good 30 minutes or so. He describes his thought process about a myriad of things in life since he was a child basically devoid of feeling and knowing that he was different from others. John and I have taken psychedelics many times, not together, so I asked him, what do you experience when you trip? He replied, oh, visual hallucinations, but mentally all my trips are the same. They're just very dark. I don't have euphoric love or other bliss feelings that some people describe. I have dark fantasies. He goes on to say that... He has a proclivity for violence, that it is the only thing that he thinks about that makes him feel anything at all. Then he tells me that he's also killed someone. At this point, the room is spinning around me. I'm utterly terrified, and had been for a while, and was silently screaming in panic. I didn't feel threatened by him, but I could tell that he was being completely sincere. I've known him since we were kids. He was calm. My eyes were darting around the room though when they weren't met with his, looking for an exit alibi. He starts in on the details of the murder. Apparently he shot a man in the head, a stranger who was unsuspecting. He didn't go into much detail. He was apologizing to me profusely between every detail that he did tell, saying that he deeply regrets telling me all of this about himself, that I'm a beautiful person and that he can't believe I'm the one that he confessed to. He mentions many times that I'm the only person that he's ever told any of this to. He also tells me that he doesn't regret it. 
He then says that he's going to end it all now, that he's admitted this to me, and because all he wants to do is kill people, he then says that he's going to end himself now, that he's admitted this to me, and because all he wants to do is kill people, particularly strangers, he then says that if he doesn't end himself, that he'll do it again. We discuss therapy and other options, but ultimately he says that he's going to do it, and now I know why. This entire conversation lasted about two and a half hours. At the end, he swears me to secrecy and tells me that I've been a good friend and gives me his last goodbyes. And now, I'm sure you're wondering, did he actually follow through with it? Well, no, he didn't. And I ended up confiding in a few mutual friends, basically stating, stay away from John. I didn't go to the police as John told me that I was the only person he'd ever confided in. But one of my friends who I confided in did go to the police. I don't think anything came of it in the end. John reached out to me several months later telling me that he desperately wanted to kill again. The desire was so strong and he wishes that he could just do it to himself. I blocked him after this on everything. But I did run into him at another party about a year later and we exchanged greetings like nothing weird had ever happened between us. It was the strangest thing, and I dread running into him again. When I was younger, my family and I used to live in this townhouse neighborhood. But my dad was a maintenance worker there, and as our family grew bigger, I came first, followed by my sister and brother, six and eleven years later, respectively. We moved into larger townhouses that the apartment complex had available. When my parents had my younger sibling, there were plans to move out of our neighborhood and into our own house, despite only having just moved into a new townhouse a few weeks prior. We ended up moving out after only two months. While living there, I ended up having a reoccurring sleep paralysis dream of this thing that would come out of my closet. The best way that I could describe it was that it was very lanky and had glowing white eyes and it never made any noise. Scattered throughout those two months living there, I would keep dreaming of it slowly opening my closet, peeking its head out and slowly shuffling towards me. Each night I had the dream, it seemed to be getting closer to my bed too. Now, if my experience stopped there, I would definitely just mark it all down as sleep paralysis. But my last night sleeping there and the following morning before moving makes me question everything that happened and whether or not it was real or just in my head. So, pretty much everything had been taken out of my room except for my mattress since we were moving the next day. So I basically just slept that night in a bare room. Of course, I had to be visited one last time by this sleep paralysis thing before I went away. And this night, it ended up right beside me, looking down, and reached down and actually grabbed my arm. But that was when I jolted awake to find a huge scratch running from my armpit to my inner elbow. I remember it stinging like a bee sting, and it definitely wasn't there when I went to bed. And my dad coming in to see me freaking out and crying. After calming down, we also ate breakfast and did a sweep throughout the house to make sure that we weren't leaving anything behind. Me and my dad went to my room and got the mattress and then opened up the closet to make sure everything was grabbed in there. But as he opened it, half of our attic crawl space access panel fell to the ground, startling both of us. Up until this point, everything about my dreams could have easily been explained. But this last night there is what really scares me. Those panels, they don't just simply break. You have to put a decent amount of force on them to start to crack them apart like that. None of us know of anything that could have caused that to happen, and we've thought about it endlessly. That, plus the fact that I had that scratch after the dream. I don't know. There was something weird about that house. If anyone has any ideas as to what to happen over the course of those months, or if anyone has had any similar experiences, then please do let me know. It was the fall of 2009, and at the time, I was 16 years old. I live in the central part of North Carolina, and nowadays, the cities are loaded with things to do for Halloween season, 
but back then the most form of entertainment that I could come up with was to visit the Devil's Tramping Ground with a few friends. The Devil's Tramping Ground is a local legend and it was about an hour away from where I lived and I had just gotten my license so why not? For those of you who are unfamiliar with the locale or its legend, the Devil's Tramping Ground is a perfect circular spot of dead soil in the middle of the woods. And despite the greenery around it, nothing grows in that circle. The legend says that if you drop or leave anything in the circle, it's moved and or disappears by morning, as the devil supposedly comes here to plot his evil doings against humanity late at night, pacing in a circle as he thinks. That's basically the gist of it, but feel free to do a little bit of research if you're interested because it's a decent read. Anyway, the city is a sticks and barns town with long barren roads that seemingly translate to don't stop until you get the heck out of here. It was one such road too where I began to feel uneasy. Rural areas always have that heavy sort of twilight zone energy and the road that we were on conveniently titled Devil's Tramping Ground Road, was completely lacking streetlights. The only thing illuminating the overworked asphalt was the fading yellow headlights of my 2002 Mercury Cougar and the useless glow of a crescent moon. In those dim lights, we began to see splattered graffiti on the road leading up to the location. Creepy things that I really didn't expect, I guess, but never really would have understood the impact of until, well, I saw them. In white paint, the road was decorated in crude warnings. The one that I remember the most was the devil lives here and a huge white cross in front of an opening in the forest. I parked on the side of the road though. The grounds were immediately not as creepy as I expected to be honest. It was not too deep into the woods either. In fact, the clearing could be made out from the road pretty much. Not as menacing as I had imagined. Maybe it was the empty beer cans or red solo cups lying all around. Obviously people partied there. Or maybe it was the jokes my friends and I started making almost immediately that calmed my nerves. But it was two something in the morning. We decided to catch Lucifer right on his hour. And I remember feeling less on edge than I was on the road. My flashlight would get eaten through the trees if I moved it upwards so I focused its beam on the soil truly more interested in finding signs of the paranormal than my friends were. It was four of us total. Two of my friends went back to the car after a while as well. It was cold and there was not much to see really so I stayed back with a buddy of mine though. I brought Ziplocs with me along with a pocket bible, a rosary in my pocket, just in case you know, and a stuffed rabbit that one of my best friends had given me. Before leaving I scooped up some dirt and added it to the Ziploc. I know that that might sound a little weird, but I found the prospect of completely dead soil really interesting and figured that maybe studying under proper light compared to other soil would give me a better idea of what maybe happened here. Alien radiation, maybe? Climate change? Sulfur? Maybe the devil was just busy that night. In between all the jokes and complaining about the cold though, we suddenly heard someone walking in the depths of the woods. This wasn't a mistaken sound too. This was a I think someone is walking in the woods sound. It was definite and it was a definite feeling too. This was deep behind the brush between the trees and these steps were heavy and unashamed of being heard. And I think it was at this point that this was the first time that I noticed no crickets were in these woods. There was no sound in fact other than us and these well, steps and I was even more unwilling to lift my little flashlight, which was tucked under my armpit now and pointed towards my soil sample. My eyes didn't need adjusting and so we sort of stood there as I made out the shape of, well, something in those woods. It was dark, but I could definitely see it. It was tall, but not disgustingly tall, I guess. It was human shaped. It definitely stood on two feet. It would walk and walk and then sort of stop in a pattern. I think it was coming towards us, but it was at this point that we were petrified. Neither my friend or I moved a muscle. I don't even think we breathed. I was so overcome with fear that I felt numb, but 
A little tremble ran through my entire body, and we just sort of, well, stood there and stared. Later we would discuss how we both wondered if it had seen us, and talk about how we didn't want to move in case it hadn't. And at this future time, we would also discuss the smell. It was awful. A putrid scent. The burning feces, rotten eggs, rotten meat. It was something like that. I grew up a Catholic, hence the Bible and the Rosary, and have always been told that smell means the devil is around. And having all this in the back of my mind at that point certainly didn't help. This thing stayed there too, toying with us among the sticks of the forest. I say sticks because at the time, very little greenery was actually alive. I was certain at one point that it saw me too. I had that sort of sixth sense feeling I was being stared right back at. And suddenly I had the weirdest feeling. A feeling of overwhelming, unbearable despair. I realized then that my friend had been clutching the back collar of my shirt... I think I was so paralyzed with fear that I had ceased to feel anything but that numbness. I wasn't even cold anymore. But when I felt my friend's hand, I just dropped everything in my arms, stood up, and hauled my butt back to the car. Not running, but just very hurried. I was sure that my friend was behind me, but between us and in all honesty, I didn't even think about it at that time. I just wanted to get out of there, and I was ready to go. In fact... I was so ready to go that I missed the clear path completely and took off between trees and brush heading towards the yellow glow of the headlights. It wasn't an incredibly long trek or anything, like I said before. The road was right there, but it felt awful and really long to me because I did this. And it was enough for those tiny branches to leave little scrapes and even some cuts down my hands, cheeks and neck. And although retelling this story makes it seem like it went on for a long time... But this whole ordeal couldn't have lasted very long. When I got back to my car though, the keys were already in the ignition. The other two friends had the heat on, and they both asked me what happened. The friend who stayed behind with me got in the passenger seat soon after, and we took off. Our other friends, the ones who had been in the car, suddenly pointed out though that our eyes were swollen and like bright red. I think maybe we'd been crying, or at least it looked like we had been. I looked in the rearview mirror, and my pupils as well were like abnormally dilated. My eyelids were puffy and tender and red. Keep in mind, this could all have some form of explanation. Maybe the fear made us cry without us knowing. Maybe the darkness combined with our nervous reactions enlarged our pupils. Maybe the dirt did something. But the whole thing was still very odd. I realized long after that that I actually left my Bible there, my stuffed rabbit, and my Ziploc bag of dirt in the circle. I considered going back the next day in broad daylight, but I haven't been back since. Oddly enough, too, I still wonder and worry about what or who might have my stuff. <laughs> 